The devil is absolutely in the detail when it comes to this stuff and avoiding a mistake is my big passion. Like we don't know what we don't know. So go and get an expert to tell you the truth about what's right and what's wrong and what's right for you. It's a really complex area, the divorce area, and I think it's a classic case of we we don't know what we don't know and it's an area where you can make a boo-boo and usually when it comes to anything financial, the boo-boos are big. They're way more expensive than getting quality advice to prevent a mistake. The devil is absolutely in the detail when it comes to this stuff and avoiding a mistake is my big passion. So go and get an expert to tell you the truth about what's right and what's wrong and what's right for you. Welcome to the Get Invested podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests every minute of every day we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Have you ever been through a divorce or are going through one? Perhaps you've contemplated for a second while in the heat of the inevitable domestic disputes that actually make for a healthy relationship because robust discussions are actually a good sign. Or perhaps divorce has crossed your mind no matter how fleetingly when your partner has done something or hasn't done something that's really important to you and your values and your sense of trust, integrity and honesty. I'm sure you all have at some point in time. Now, relationships are tricky even at the best of times, and there's no doubt that the pandemic has put a strain on many couples over the last couple of years that may unfortunately contribute to rising divorce rates in the future. So, when it comes to divorce, my advice is always the same. Don't. Don't get divorced. Unfortunately, I've been through a divorce and my ex, myself and my son still have the deep emotional and financial scars to prove it. I wouldn't wish any of this on my worst enemy. Thankfully, I've been blessed and learnt my lessons a second time around. So, if you ever contemplate divorcing your partner, I strongly suggest reversing your thinking and instead work harder to rediscover what it was that made you fall in love with your partner in the first place. And let me give you the big tip. Little things like daily gratitude sessions and regular random unexpected acts of kindness for your partner can go a long way towards this. Now, I know this is easy to say and harder to do because I know that sometimes a partner will do something unforgivable and there's no going back. But the cost of divorce is long and lasting and can take decades, if ever, to recover from. So to set the scene for our special guest today, I thought I'd delve into the sad world of divorce, as it's right up there with death, moving house and public speaking as life's greatest stresses, and one of the biggest risks to your self, health, wealth and sustainable success in however you choose to define it. And again, unfortunately, the incidence of divorce and separation are on the increase. And as a fellow investor, I strongly recommend that you get invested in your close relationships as they will make or break every aspect of your life and even how long and healthy you end up living. And unfortunately, this is especially so for women, as you'll hear in our chat with Helen Baker today. So let me ask you, are you or do you know a woman who's struggling to make ends meet and is concerned about her financial future? I'm sure you do. Unfortunately, the gender gap and maternity leave 
alongside increasing rates of divorce and separation, mean that one in three women stop work with no retirement savings at all. And those that do manage to save often end up with less than half the retirement funds of we mere males. And while we're on the subject, let me share some other surprising ear-opening divorce and separation statistics. According to a recent survey by finder.com.au, there are over 50,000 divorces a year granted in Australia. And the current average duration from marriage to divorce is just 12.1 years, while the average duration to separation is only 8.4 years. According to the ABS in 2019, there was one divorce for every 2.3 marriages that were registered, and the medium age at divorce has risen over the last 10 years to 45.9 years for males and 43.1 years for females. The Find a Consumer Sentiment Tracker also found that on a state-by-state basis, the percentage of divorcees varies quite considerably. Tasmania has the most divorcees at 12%, WA has 9%, Queensland, South Australia and the Northern Territory are at 8%, New South Wales and Victoria drop down to 7%, and the ACT only has 4%. So perhaps we all need to move to Canberra. And according to hopesandfears.com, Australia has a national divorce rate of 43%, which is the highest rate in the world behind Canada and France. They also found that more and more marriages are staying together just for the kids. And reinforcing this, a report by the Australian Institute of Family Studies uncovered that more Australians are divorcing after 20 years or more of marriage, waiting for their children to leave the nest before they do as well. According to various studies reported in itsovereasy.com, the three most common causes of divorce are conflict, arguing, irretrievable breakdown in the relationship, lack of commitment, infidelity, and lack of physical intimacy. Interestingly, The least common reasons are lack of shared interests and incompatibility between partners. Clearly, a breakdown in honesty and growing distrust are big divorce contributors. And according to the finder.com.au survey, one in four Australians has lied to a partner about money or been lied to about finances. The finder survey also found that men are twice as likely to lie about their money with 20% of men saying they have been untruthful to their significant other, compared to 9% of women. Finder also uncovered that having hidden debt is the biggest reason for lying, with 50% of those who have been in an untruthful relationship saying unpaid dues were the cause of dishonesty. The research also revealed 44% of partners in untruthful relationships lie because they wanted to maintain control over their own finances. Meanwhile, just over one third of partners in untruthful relationships have hidden secret purchases from their partner, with women more likely to have concealed their spending than men. Stats on divorcees, financial management habits are also quite interesting, with divorcees more likely to be spenders, where those who are divorced are more than twice as likely to have five or more years worth of credit card debt, as opposed to those who are married. Divorcees are also more likely to classify themselves as spenders than those who are married. The Finder survey found 47% of those, or nearly half, who are divorced say they are spenders rather than savers, compared to 38% of those who are married. Now, these are quite disturbing statistics in this day and age. So what can hard-working Aussie women and those that care about them do about it? Well, this is where today's special guest, Helen Baker, and her great book, On Your Own Two Feet, comes to the rescue. So to further whet your appetite for our great conversation today, let me share a modified extract from her book, On Your Own Two Feet, on the subject of divorce with a focus on women, if you or anyone that you know is unlucky enough to end up in this situation, although her words of wisdom are just as applicable to men or same-sex relationships. So let's start with chapter 15 on divorce and de facto relationship breakups, where Helen draws attention to the issues that women face. The big issue everyone faces is actually twofold these days. We're generally living longer 
and the cost of living keep rising. Everything keeps going up. What does that say? It says, <laughs> I have to build a big pot to take care of my now and my future. Medical advances have improved life expectancy dramatically. Life expectancy now in Australia is 82.8 years, which is above the OECD average of just 80.7 years. And a baby born, a baby girl born in Australia in 2015 can expect to live to the ripe old age of 93. So with a longer life have come greater expectations of how those years after work are going to be lived. Retirement today isn't about sitting and knitting. Today's retirees are very active. They're involved in community and with family, and they're the darlings of tour group operators in the caravan industry. The catch to all this good news and good living is a five-letter word, M-O-N-E-Y, money. And it's both a long-term problem as well as a now issue. So on this lot, let's consider the flow-on impact of the gender pay gap. In many fields worldwide, women still earn less than men (coughs) for exactly the same roles. Australia's full-time gender pay gap is currently 13.4%. And as at November 2020, women's average weekly ordinary full-time earnings across all industries and occupations was $1,562 a week, compared to men's average weekly ordinary full-time earnings of around $1,804. That means Jean has an average of $242 per week less than John in her pay packet for exactly the same job. Now, this doesn't sound that much when you say it like that now, does it? But let's calculate that out. That's over $12,594 a year. And it impacts significantly on superannuation as well. Over $1,196 per year less is paid into Jean's account with compounding interest implications. As at February 2021, Australia's cumulative retirement system means women continue to retire with roughly half the superannuation of men, with the overall gender difference in superannuation balances standing at 38.8%. So the flow-on impacts of gender pay discrepancies are very real. If a woman earns less than a man for the same job, her capacity to save is reduced, her superannuation balance is less, assuming identical investments, as compulsory superannuation contributions are based on salary. Her chance of recovery from a financial setback is therefore harder because there's less cushioning to break a fall and less to rebuild with. Now, women still tend to be the primary carer of children, taking time out of the workforce or opting for part-time work for a few years at least. Now, Helen sees women taking time out of the paid workforce also to care for ageing family members. This has given rise to what is now called the sandwich generation. Such compromises, choosing family over career, impact superannuation. Even when there's nothing or not a lot going into the account, fees and charges nibble away at the balance, and you can actually find it going backwards in those years when returns are down. Less money, less superannuation, less savings, less for the future. And all this in addition to women typically outliving men quite considerably. On top of this, COVID has highlighted the she recession. Many of the industries hit the hardest have been actually dominated by women. Many women take on the part-time and lower paid roles to balance out their career with family life. You often see women in reception and admin roles, waitressing in cafes or as baristas, in retail, childcare, gyms, particularly female-specific gyms, and the travel sector, as many women occupy the flight attendant roles and the service desks. Women still suffer from the gender pay gap and therefore their recovery time would take a lot longer than a man's, both from a disposable income perspective, as well as reduced superannuation prior to COVID, potentially no superannuation during the COVID time, and then lower superannuation going forward. Many women also tend to be sacrificial in that they sacrifice what they need in order to keep them on their own two feet. However, the big mistake many women make is to sacrifice their personal situation for their children's benefit. And this can be an issue if they're helping out their children who also have hit hurdles during this time. And all of this contributes to what Helen calls the career choice gap, 
or CCG. Women choose careers that are generally those paid well below the average salary and or women choose roles they'd prefer not to do for financial reasons or due to childcare costs. Helen also thinks it's unwise to bank on a government age pension that may tide us over in our retirement years, particularly when they may stretch to three or more decades. And who's to say there's even going to be such a pension in years to come? Now, the single pension of a bit over 20 grand a year is definitely not enough to live on if, if you go on figures in March 2021, a single person requires at least $44,000 a year to live comfortably in retirement. The Australian Government has also tweaked the levels of assets that determines eligibility for Centrelink support in the past, and this may happen again. And it could be a game changer to your overall position, relegating you to a diminishing part pension, or worse still, nothing at all. So, forewarned is forearmed. Plan to overshoot what you need to protect yourself against future changes. Let's now turn to your place to call home. In recent times, more young adults are actually staying home for longer. The most current Australian census indicates that 43% of 20 to 24 year olds are still living with their parents, 17% of 25 to 29 year olds, and 7% of 30 to 35 year olds also still live at home, all eating into parent savings. Now, as we've already mentioned, women have longer life expectancies than men, are more likely to experience career interruptions, and are less inclined than men to remarry following a marital breakdown. Hence, ageing female mortgages face multiple challenges. Housing affordability has also seen women aged over 60 become Australia's new homeless. The stories brought to light in the SBS program Insight underscored just how tragic this is. For example, Sharon, who had taken a sabbatical from her six-figure corporate salary to be with her parents when they died and ran her finances down, expected to land a similar job when needed, only to find that she couldn't. Doris, on the other hand, lost her home and her hairdressing business after two floods and a fire and lengthy legal battles. And Di, his 43-year-old marriage that ended in 2010, was left with just $8,000, no work and no permanent address. Like Helen, I found these stories heart-wrenching because so much could have been prevented with good financial foundations and quality financial advice. But now for some good news, because in Helen's experience, women are excellent money managers. Women are great at multitasking and managing finer details. So despite earning less, women can actually make great financial decisions and are willing to seek advice and act on it as long as they feel safe. This accelerates women from where they could be to a much better position. And in alignment with my own thinking, small actions over a sustained period generally produce a better result than taking big risks down the track. It's said that time is a great healer, but it's also a big influence when investing. So what it takes to position ourselves better to be on our own feet financially are a change in mindset along with good, solid foundations. So let's now drill into relationship breakups and their financial impacts, where Helen suggests a four-phase approach to it's over, and she breaks down the five main divorce mistakes that you can't afford to make. No matter which side of the fence you're on, divorce or a de facto split is difficult. No one wins. How do two people whose hearts flip-flop when they even thought of each other get to a point where they can no longer stand the sight of each other. Unfortunately, it happens way too often. Over 50,000 heterosexual marriages will end in divorce this year. Statistics around de facto splits are not clear and same-sex marriages are possibly still in the honeymoon phase having only been legalised in Australia in 2017. So for your own sanity, Helen suggests dealing with the fallout of a split as quickly as you can to regain peace of mind that will only be robbed by prolonged angst, stress and anxiety. And note that Helen says quickly, not rashly. Relationship splits are a confusing time. Working out what is in your best interests 
is not always easy. Women often agree to a settlement of taking the family home, leaving other investments behind. And that's not necessarily the best or the smartest thing to do. Many women have not been privy to the financial side of things. Some because you just can't do anything, and others because of financial abuse. And what many people don't understand is that financial abuse is a form of domestic violence. Since Helen wrote her first and second editions of her book, coercive control, such as jealousy, suspicion of friends, constant insults, or monitoring of movements, is also moving into the coercive control category. And Helen has also written an entire book about financial issues surrounding divorce. So this chapter serves to touch on the things you must absolutely know and do if you even suspect you could be looking at this scenario. And when it comes to the crunch, Helen suggests a four-phase approach to it's over. When a marriage or long-term relationship ends, it's not as simple as before and after. Helen sees four clear phases that form a process helping women to define what they want, understand what they need, and fast-track them on their way saving both parties a lot of money along the way. These four phases are pre-settlement, negotiation, post-settlement and rebuilding. The pre-settlement phase involves understanding what you're entitled to, what assets are in the pool, weighing up the pros and cons of these assets and determining which assets align with your values and future goals and which align with your exes. Pre-settlement also helps define what you need for income where that will come from, and what lifestyle changes you can make. So now is the time to set your financial foundations in place, to become financially independent. With this pre-settlement grounding, you have something documented to take to your lawyer to negotiate on your behalf. Once the settlement documents are produced for the lawyer, and in conjunction with your professional team, most can settle out of court very quickly, saving both time and money. There's also the considerable added bonus of no more stress and fighting, because peace has no price tag. But if it doesn't settle there, you do have the advantage of understanding what works for you and why, and the paperwork to go before the courts, all professionally organised. Post-settlement, you come away with what you've negotiated, maybe a little more than expected or sometimes a little less. Then it's time to focus on rebuilding starting with the foundations that Helen Helen actually covers in Chapter 3 of her book that will give you the stability that you need going forward. So how do you determine a financial split? Income and assets are the two main financial issues to consider in divorce. Until the property settlement, where are you going to draw your income from? As for assets, what should you take? In this regard, here are Helen's four key steps. Firstly, define all the assets in the pool. Secondly, determine what contributions have been made both financially and non-financially. For example, staying at home to look after the children is often viewed to be just as valuable as working and earning a salary. So don't get, don't get the wool pulled over your eyes there. Thirdly, what are the future needs of both parties? Is someone disabled or in need of retraining? What specific needs should be considered? And lastly, would a court consider the settlement just and equitable? When thinking of income, consider the cost of your children's daily living. How much child support is actually needed? Will their education be separate or part of the settlement or a part of the daily budget? You also need to avoid the following five divorce mistakes that you can't afford to make. Mistake number one, my lawyer has all the answers. One of the biggest mistakes people make is to rely on a lawyer for all aspects of divorce. Yes, you certainly need to see a lawyer, regardless of whether children are involved, because they know the law and will guide you through any legal issues that need dealing with. They are great at legally drafting what you need to close your property settlement and your divorce, and can advise you on likely entitlements under the Family Law Act. Lawyers are not, however, authorised to give financial advice. You need a licensed financial advisor, ideally with divorce planning expertise, who has the skills and insight to scope your goals and values for both now and the future, and assess the assets that would help you achieve those goals, and who can provide detailed realistic options and easy to understand calculations, 
of what an asset split could look like and mean for you. Professional advice also takes any recourse off the lawyer over money matters and assets. Mistake number two, believing you're not entitled. Early in the discovery process, we identify exactly what assets are up for grabs. Property, investments, shares, including shares in the spouse's private company, superannuation, cash, certain trusts, anything that has value or potential value. And it doesn't matter whose name's on it. Don't be bullied. Don't fall for the old, I've worked while you've stayed at home so you're not entitled, or the old, this is my superannuation line. Those statements are wrong. Mistake number three, I just want the house. Women particularly have an emotional attachment to the family home, particularly when children are involved. As a result, it's common to see women keep the family home, leaving all other assets to the husband. Now, this is not always a good option, and here are a few reasons why. The upkeep of a large home can be a financial drain. Can you comfortably afford all those costs on your own earnings? If you're relying on your ex for outstanding mortgage repayments, what happens if he loses his job or defaults on the payments? If all your money is going into the house, there's often little left for extras that you deserve, such as family holidays or little luxuries that promote self-care, such as a relaxation massage or a new pair of shoes. Staying put so as to keep the children stable is commendable. Staying put to keep up appearances is not. Children are likely to be far more resilient than you think. Children do grow up and leave home. Without other investments, you may have to sell the family home to fund your future. Is downsizing an option for you, providing some surplus funds for investments? That's a tough question that only you can answer. Most people I've seen want to stay where they are or maintain their standard of living. But something has to give. Some women can't see the value in their ex-husband's superannuation or its tax effectiveness, so they leave him with a pot of gold come retirement time. Now you may be tempted to think, well I'll sell the house and rent instead, then I'll have money and I won't have to worry about rates or maintenance or home insurance. Now that's true, but what about long term? Once you're out of the property market, it can be very difficult to buy back in. And it's worth raising the issue of security. A landlord could kick you out. It may be worth buying something a little smaller, a little further afield. Mistake number four, wanting your day in court. Now, you're really hurt and pinged off with your dearly ex-beloved, and you want to hear the judge beat down on the other side and say how bad they were. You want your day in court. Surprisingly, the judge might not see the situation your way. It takes a very long time and the costs associated with this risk can be seriously damaging. Sometimes it's better to know in your heart that you were right and settle and then move on. Imagine the potential growth that you could have earned over two to three years on the investments that you've settled on rather than waiting for your day in court, forgoing that growth and having to suffer all the extra legal fees, the stress and the torment. Mistake number five, we were just sleepover buddies. They have no claim on me. Now you may be someone with considerable assets. You may have a friend who sleeps over regularly, what you smilingly think of as close friends with benefits. So when do sleep buddies become de facto? That's an increasingly grey area legally. You need to be aware of it. You may well be in a de facto relationship without even living together. And that means that your assets may be up for grabs. Now these are just five of a number of common divorce mistakes that Helen's seen. Others are detailed in her other book, On Your Own Two Feet Divorce, Your Survive and Thrive Financial Guide, which empowers women to make more educated and informed decisions about their financial situation, wherever they are on Heartbreak Road, shining the light on more common mistakes and exploding some this as well. To grab a copy, just go to onyourowntwofeet.square.site. And you probably noticed that my dog, Jakira, agrees. She barked in the background there. Now, remember back to your wedding day? It's likely that uh, one or either of you engaged a makeup artist, hairdresser, dressmaker, perhaps venue coordinators. 
you had groomsmen and bridesmaids or more to help. Helen's point here is that you are unlikely to be on your own in preparing for it. And the same goes for divorce. In Helen's opinion, you need at least a specialist family lawyer, a financial advisor, an emotional counsellor like a psychologist, and of course, I'm going to add in a savvy mortgage broker like our team at Know How Property Finance, so that you can confirm early both your and your ex's ability to reborrow when you're divvying up the assets if payouts are involved to ensure that it's all actually doable. So in conclusion, when it comes to divorce and separation, be clear on your goals. Understand the pros and cons before you sign on the bottom line. Remember, you can't buy peace. They just don't sell it on a shop. There's no point fighting over something you don't want or that doesn't work for you. The stresses of divorce, the fighting and anxiety can result in long-term damage that costs way more than making wise decisions. And all of this is just a smattering of what Helen, Helen covers in her book and during our great conversation today. She also talks about life events that can force a rethink, whether they're experiences that can make you feel like the rug's been pulled out from under you or life, life stages such as preparing to retire. These life-changing events and their financial impacts covered in Helen's book and our deep dive in our chat today include things like stretching strategies for living single, managing money as a couple based on your money styles, how to protect against STD or sexually transmitted debt, saving tips and tricks to set you up for life, parenting and pets considerations, midlife gap year adventure travels, escaping to the country, personal injury and terminal illness impacts, aged care options and widowhood. Today we also chat about her time working for the singer-songwriter and legend Robbie Williams, so listen out for this, the need to always have a backup plan, And we go into detail about her five fundamental financial foundations, plus a whole lot more. And it's worth emphasising that Helen Baker is not your typical financial planner. She's a qualified practising and licensed financial advisor and founder of her business that has the same name as her books, On Your Own Two Feet, an Australia-wide service dedicated to empowering women to gain and retain their financial freedom. Helen has two master's degrees, one in financial planning and the other in Innovation and Change Management, as well as a Bachelor of Commerce or Accounting degree. She has also completed the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority, or FASEA, exam, which is the latest and highest standard in the financial services industry. Helen is also a finalist for Australia's Financial Planner of the Year and a two-time finalist for the Women's Community Program of the Year. She is also the recipient of the Alison Stewart Award for Community Contribution for her outstanding work across community and charity and her endeavours to improve financial literacy for those who need it most. Helen's a regular panellist, talking money matters on all major Australian and New Zealand television stations, and her expert opinions are regularly sought after by national radio, magazines and newspapers. As you'll hear, Helen firmly believes in the benefits of having a strong team of professionals to underpin your financial foundations. This support enables you to build for the future and be the best you can be. Whether you're in a relationship, divorced, widowed or single, and just want to take control financially and get going for the future, Helen is there to help you. As she says, being the best you can be is not about perfection. That's an exhausting and unachievable expectation to have. To her mind, it's about being whole and true, safe and free, and being right for you. Achieving all we want to be inevitably requires some expert support, guidance and advice. And in this regard, On Your Own Two Feet celebrates individuality while helping you be the best you can be financially. And if you're looking to get on your own two feet by investing in property, no matter where you're at, whether you're a beginner or a seasoned investor that's struggling with your portfolio, I'd like to invite you to join me on our unique Know How Property Freedom Formula Flight Programme where I'll personally guide you through our proven process for property investment success and or complete a review of your current portfolio to see how we can improve it, how you can reduce your costs and how you can increase your property purchasing capacity. To book your free ticket or for find out more, just go to knowhowproperty.com.au forward slash freedomfighters. 
Now, Helen Baker's greatest wish is that you realise that there's a plan and purpose for each and every one of us based on our unique gifts, talents, goals and values. So with this in mind, enjoy this great chat with Helen Baker. Hi, Freedom Fighters. Now, in the wonderful world of finance, women are often coming from behind the eight ball and have actually quite unique challenges that are very often overlooked. So regardless of whether you're in a relationship, divorced, widowed or footloose and fancy free, it's more important than ever to take control financially, to get going for the future and be the best that you can be. But where do you turn to for specific advice that's suited to your needs? Well, to discuss these unique challenges and ways to overcome them. We're joined by Helen Baker, the founder of On Your Own Two Feet Financial Planning and a book of the same name. So welcome and let's get invested, Helen. Hello, how are you? Very good, Helen. Now, uh, I've been uh, sort of following your pathway for a while and you've written a couple of fantastic books, but uh, for those who don't know who you are, can you start off by giving us a rundown on who you are, what you do, and most importantly, Helen, why you do what you do? It's always the hardest one, isn't it, when you've got to talk about yourself. You can talk about anybody else but yourself usually. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, we founded On Your Own Two Feet about 11 years ago. Uh, so it's actually my third career. I was an accountant, but apparently I was a little bit too funny for that. So <laughs> <laughs> and then I moved into more of a, a project management role and lived and worked overseas for quite a long time and came back and uh, started working as a general manager of a financial planning firm and then uh, they were on different pages and so it all sort of fell apart and then one of the guys said to me, Helen, I think you should be an advice and I was like, oh no, I don't want to do that, sell things for commission and he was like, no, we'll go fee for service and so on and I thought, well, it kind of lined up with the finance background, the project management of either fixing things or getting people to their destination and achieving things, and then it was people. And so I thought one plus one plus one, okay, we'll, we'll give it a go. Um, and On Your Own Two Feet has been going really around about that 11, 12-year mark now and uh, taking care of lots of people along the way. So it's been very interesting job. Yeah, I love business. it. And there must be there must be something about feet with financial planners, Helen, because uh, good old Scott Pape with the Barefoot Investor is uh, is is big on not wearing shoes. But uh, everything I've read and 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 uh, a big topic of your books it revolves around the uh, footwear. So uh, is that just coincidence, or tell me about that? It it was a coincidence. It was I'm. Was always pretty well known around town and through friends of my shoes. The amount of times that people used to say, I love your shoes, I love your shoes. And then when I spoke to um, a logo design person, they just happened to put these two shoes on the front. And so we all go, well, that makes sense because of the shoe thing. But I have a problem actually with my foot and um, it comes back recurring and the passion of my life is playing football. So... I have to, you will often see me really just running around in trainers most of the time and then put my heels on if I have to and back in my trainers. So, yeah, (laughs) I'm still on my own two feet though. (laughs) Good to hear. Yeah, And it's a great name. I I, I love it because it's sort of a a great analogy for how you're helping people and what you're doing with them. And we'll come back to the football piece in a minute. But uh, I'd love to circle back and unpack a little bit more of uh, what you sort of mentioned in terms of the the summary of your journey so far. Uh, if, if we go way back when, uh, and I, from what I picked up from what you just said, that accountancy was your your first uh, career essentially, uh, what was the attraction to accountancy? I'm, I'm assuming that came out of the high school exercise, right, I'm going to go off to uni and become an accountant. What, what uh, drove that career choice at that point in time? Yeah, my actual career choice originally was to be a commercial teacher, which was about teaching bookkeeping and accounting at school and shorthand. I don't even know if shorthand even exists anywhere <laughs> these days. Um, and typewriting as well, which is also, you know, kind of obsolete from poke your finger all the way down and lose your finger because it was a very different setup to this touch typing laptops these days. 
Um, so it didn't it didn't unfold that way. But it's ironic when I think when I meet with clients now, I draw everything on the board so they can follow what you're saying and they can engage with the picture of that. And so you go back and you think, okay, I used to draw on the blackboard at home. I used to want to do those kind of pieces. And I think when you get up to this age and you look back, you can see how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together and it's quite amazing. So it's if you'd have told me I would be under the financial advice banner at this stage of my life, I would have said no way. But <laughs> it kind of is now when I break it down to what we actually do, which is teaching and educating and empowering and changing people's lives and achieving things it's really exciting but the financial advice term probably says something different I think financial advice says to people oh I just give you my money and you get a commission on it and you're there to sell me something and I think that's very different to to what we do and what a lot of other really quality advisors out there do. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the industry has uh, been stigmatised to some degree, yeah, particularly brought to focus with the Royal Commission and uh, we've got a, a finance breaking arm um, of our business that copped a, a, a similar flogging in the media in particular. Uh, so it, it sort of creates some challenges for someone who is genuine about what they're doing and, and follows for the fee-for-service path that you spoke about earlier rather than a hidden hidden brown paper bag commissions behind the scenes. Um, but but before we sort of tackle that area in, in particular then, you sort of got into accountancy and then, then you shift into project management. Now, they're, again, they're two, I would have thought, quite disparate uh, choices and quite different skill skill sets. I mean, most accountants I, I know are, are you know, very good at, at crunching numbers and the the, the ruling side of it, but uh, project management wouldn't have been a skill set that I'd normally attribute to them. Uh, is that something that was inherent in you or was it a circumstantial thing that led you in that direction? Tell us about that journey. Yeah, so I guess from an accounting perspective, I wasn't doing the um, receive the shoebox, work through the receipts accounting. I was actually doing managerial accounting, so working inside um, organisations and it was the era where IT was coming into play and there was a lot of projects on the go with technology developments and efficiency. It was manufacturing that I, the companies that I often worked in, which again, doesn't really exist so much now. Yeah. It's all sort of done in China. But back then you had opportunities to, you know, look at how you could make um, the back end more efficient. And so you would be implementing projects that were doing that and following that. But I think it's just... I'm a very organised person in my mind. I'm very much a planning person and so I like things to be laid out and hit targets and I've always been that way inclined. Organised as in don't look at my office, my house, my car because that is not organised, <laughs> but organised in terms of, okay, I want to achieve this, how do I achieve that and then working backwards and then ticking off those steps and going. So I think the, the accounting side... The managerial accounting side of it was the maths person that was within me that, um, you know, the great thing with maths is it has to add up. So getting all of that, the debits and the credits, I understand that that kind of flows for me. But then the things that make my heart sing is achieving something and making things happen and things that are stuck and that kind of thing and rolling and getting it happening and then seeing that the result of that and seeing achievement. So I think that's where it comes together. So, yeah, I probably don't sit in the very um, traditional expectation of what an accountant is, um, but all due respect because we need them. So Yes, I <laughs> and, totally And my agree. sister-in-law is one. <laughs> no, no, 100%. I mean, the, 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 a good accountant is worth their weight in gold. There's no question about it. Totally agree there. Tell me, this, this sort of natural uh, uh, leaning towards being uh, you know, planning and organised, where, where does that come from? Is that a nature or a nurture thing, do you think, Kellen? That's a really good question. I don't know where it comes from, but when I was young and, you know, we used to play sport and we used to travel for sport back in the day. Um, so, you know, you were on the bus and 
you went at, back then, you know, no parents came back in those days. You just went with your coach and your, and your chaperone and so you had to be organised, make sure you had all your gear, um, manage your money because you got a little bit of a, an amount that you had to manage to get your drink or your food or however that worked and we used to get billeted in those days. So you had to be pretty organised. I think it just comes all the way through that that's the way some of us are just wired. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, you sort of um, mentioned the football exercise briefly uh, earlier and I understand you're still beating a ball around. Uh, where, where do the, and I'm, are we talking AFL? Are we talking rugby? What, what sort of uh, brand of football are we talking, Helen? That real football one, the one, as my dad would say, you play with your feet, which is uh, soccer in this country, but we come from the UK, so it's football for us. And, um, yeah, so I, I grew up, my dad was a referee and a coach and my brothers played, but I am in the era where women did not play football. Mm. Um, it was, there was just no team, so you just so... It actually worked in my favour to a point because whilst I'm not uh, Ronaldo with my footwork like some of the women are today who are fantastic with their footwork, I read the game very well because that's all I was allowed to do was sit on the side and watch, watch my brothers play, watch other teams play. And so that sort of works for me. I play centre midfield and that's the engine room and I've always had people say, you know, that your ability to read the game and to organise other players. So um, I love it. It's uh, as long as I can play, I'm going to keep going. And I'm 54 now and I absolutely love it. But Mim, who plays in my team at the moment, is 63. And if she can keep going, then a lot of us have no excuse. <laughs> totally agree. I'm, I'm a, uh, a, a mad hockey nut. A field hockey nut. Go. So I'm uh, at that tender age of 60 as we speak, Helen, and um, uh, if I get through next season, I've completed 800 games of hockey since I when I started when I was 11. And I'm exactly like you. I've said to the guys, you're either going to have to shoot me or, uh, or <laughs> um, that, that's about the only thing that's going to stop me from coming out and uh, building the ball around. So uh, love your passion for that, Helen. And it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's sad that a lot of people give away uh, sport at, at a young age and allow, allow life to get in the way of it. But I just uh, – I, I, there's so many benefits of sport that, that then trickle down into everything else you do. Well, how, how do you find that? Yeah, and I said that. I fostered for a little while and I, I said to the, the young boy at the time, I said, look, we're a sporty family. I don't care what you choose to play, but you need to play something because it's the, the physical element that gets you off the couch. It's the team. It's learning to winning to win. It's learning to lose. It's engaging, making friends. Like there's a whole lot that comes out of sport that you have to do that. And I'd always said if I had my own child, I'd never let them play rugby league. And one day we were driving in the car and he said, Helen, you know how you said I had to pick a sport? And because I said, no rush, when you're ready, you pick. And he said, uh, I said, yes. And um, he goes, well, you know, with with football, with soccer, you know, I like it. And I went, mm, but you don't love it. And he said, no. And he goes, but I do know what I want to do. And I said, okay. And he said, I want to play rugby league. And I went, oh, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is classic. That is classic. Yeah, that's always a yeah. way, isn't it? Hey, uh, circling yeah. back to the, uh, the the project management front, then uh, I understand from uh, info information that uh, you shot through to us that you uh, spent some time working for Robbie Williams at uh, one stage. Can you talk us through that? Would have been fun and games, I'd imagine. Yeah, it was an interesting one. So I, I went over to London and, um, you know, as Aussies do, do the two-year thing. I didn't do it until I was 29. So I was a lot older than people who jump out of school and away they go. Yeah. Um, and I had several jobs. I had a job where I worked as a, a project manager for Europe for Wreck and Coleman, which was one of the best days, of, one of the best jobs I ever had in my life. You know, you're in London on Monday and France, Germany, Spain, Switzerland for the rest of the week. It was awesome for an Australian to go travelling like that and do some work. Yeah. And then they moved us permanently to 
where we spent the most time so they could shut down the London office, which was Paris, which sounds very glamorous, but I didn't know anybody and, you know, some Australians such as myself trying to speak French is like, yeah, not going <laughs> to, it's butchered, I think the word is, they say. Um, yeah, so not great. And so I ended up taking a redundancy and, and but staying in London and went through a series of different things. I actually went off and studied at Bible school for a little while, which is very contrasting to the entertainment industry, I guess. But yeah. um, after a little while, yeah, I got I had to go and get work again. The redundancy was running out and uh, living in London is pretty expensive. Mm. And But I felt to stay. I wanted to still stay. And then yet yeah, this opportunity came up to work there and um, I was already committed somewhere two days a week. But I was like, oh, please, God, I need an extra three days a week from somewhere. And they called and said, look, would you like to come and work for us? We heard about you Um yeah, but we only need you three days a week. And I went, well, two plus three equals five. I'll take it. And <laughs> it was amazing to experience something like that that not everybody gets to see. I think people know a lot more now with um, social media and so on, the type of lifestyles that go on and so on. So, But back then it was, you know, the 2000s, those very early days as far as social media was concerned. And... Yeah, I got to experience amazing things, you know, walking on the red carpet, the the video productions that they did, you know, there's no expense spared sometimes, you know, you get the best, the best. I remember one time where um, they said, oh, he's practising in the studio for, um, uh, I think it was the, which I can't remember which album it was, but the um, my head in my mind just imagined some, artist standing in a, a little room with a microphone singing in it you know just practicing I had no idea it was like this massive warehouse with like a 40 piece brass band must have been the swing when you're winning one actually because yeah. I think that's the first one I went to yeah because yeah, it was all the brass band was there and all of those and there's you know the six of us just sitting on on those um equipment boxes on wheels that you know and just sitting there and it's like right in front of you in this sort of private com concert. So awesome. it was really, yes, we got to do some amazing, amazing things and, and meet some extraordinary people. So I was very blessed, but I, I ended up just getting homesick in the end and I missed my mum and I missed my family and I missed Australia. And so it was kind of the end after about three or three or four years of that. Wow, it's a fairly intense period in, I mean, it, and again, there's probably a difference between the perception and the reality, but he sort of comes across as a, a wild party boy uh, that <laughs> sort of uh, lives hard and and and, <laughs> and and does everything at speed. Uh, how, how did that uh, – I, I can see, I mean, it, if you've been to Bible school and, and then you're up against a, uh, a hard and fast rock and roller, uh, so to speak, <laughs> uh, it would have been a, a potential conflict of values there to some degree. How did you, how did you reconcile that? Yeah, it's an interesting one because I think, um, yeah, it is. A, it can be a little bit wild in there and I think you just have to – be who you are like I love dancing so you'll always find me out on a dance floor first one on last one off probably um I loved that side of things um but yeah trying to keep that measured and stay true to myself and that the integrity about what I believed as well um was yeah there, there were just probably some limits around that but you know here's a very funny guy I would always say very fun if I was summing up Robbie I'd say very funny and very generous mm. yeah yeah okay that's uh and I guess that that fun and that sort of generosity uh would would sort of uh, tend to bridge the gap between his sort of fast living style and, and and your own values in that regard so no that's awesome so you came back to Australia and was that the time then that you um uh, jumped on board to become the GM for the financial planning firm is that how it came together well, it was funny because a lot of people said to me, oh, you know, with all your experiences over there, you'll get a job like that, you know, and surprisingly not because I came back to Brisbane. If I'd have probably gone to Sydney and Melbourne and stayed in the entertainment industry, the connections may have worked and I might have got onto something, but I really wanted to come home home to Brisbane. Yeah. 
And so it was very difficult because Brisbane, I don't know so much now, but back then particularly it was almost not what you know but who you know and I knew nobody because there was no real big entertainment industry up here and, um, yeah, I just didn't know anybody. I'd been away for eight years and it was starting from scratch. And so I started doing contracts back in finance. The good thing is with finance, there's always a need for finance, you know, in a business or somewhere. So it was just I started contracting just, you know, through um, a recruitment agency in an engineering firm and then I went on to do um, a completely different role helping sort of the combo of the finance and then and the guidance through an investment an investor, not as in um, – not investor, what's the word? Inventor, sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I used to being in the investor world, I was like investor, yeah, but no, the inventors. And so, again, a completely different opportunity. And then I found this opportunity for the GM role and I was like, there's no way I'm going to get it, um, but I'm just going to go for interview practice because I thought they'll give it to a guy and I'll just, I need interview practice because I've been so... <laughs> out of the loop for such a long time and um yes yeah, surprisingly got down the road said can you come back again and it was about the third time and again here I am in an interview drawing on the whiteboard with what I thought they should do with their business from what I knew about it so that I love a whiteboard and or a blackboard and um yeah so that was where it sort of happened and I went in there and I was it was a new role so I was excited because I thought I can fix everything and I can, you know, make this business grow and I can make that efficient. And, again, it was pulling on all the strings of, um, you know, where, where you thought you could add value to this organisation. But it went, yeah, it folded pretty quickly. And But I'd sort of got a little exposure to financial advice, but knowing they're very, very different beasts from accounting to financial advice is, yeah, completely different sort of worlds. Yeah, you made an interesting comment there. You said, oh, I, I thought they'd give it to a guy, but I thought I'd have a go anyway. What, I'd love to drill into that thinking. What what made you think that, uh, Helen? <laughs> yeah, I think – so I grew up obviously in the in the generation from the start of my career with what was known as the glass ceiling and women only went so far and um, either they stopped and, and stayed at home and were primary carers for the kids – or they just couldn't get past that um, that level. You know, they could only get. When I started, I was. I remember going to a a um, conference that they had picked around Australia, uh, and I think there were only two two women there that they thought had future potential out of. And I can't remember how many men it was, but it was a lot. And so very, at very early stages, I mean, you wouldn't really see that today. We haven't fully got to where we want to be, I don't think, but yeah. we've certainly come a long way from where we were. You know, I always joke in our industry, I never have to queue for the toilet at the conferences because there's so few women <laughs> in our industry, you know, at an advisor level. There's more, but when I first start, I can go in a room and still be the only one out of 20 or there's five of us out of you know 200 people you know there's um, still a, a lot of women are either not pursuing certain careers or you know they have so much else going on and I always say to women so I'm a little bit probably different in the sense of where people say women can do anything and I go well yes but no let's be realistic like we can't do everything and we can, and there are some things that we're just not built for. But my concern for women is we're expected to, you know, work full time, take care of the home, have a clean house, look after the kids, run them to sport, be fit and beautiful and even have, you know, perky breasts and all of this. It's like it's not, <laughs> it's not realistic, no. you know. We've got to be kinder to ourselves and, um, and also just, be true to ourselves. I, I, I firmly believe women do not want to be put in roles for the token opportunity. They want to be there because they believe they can really add value and they can bring something to the table. And and it's not about being better 
or worse than men. It's We're just actually different and we need to engage and respect that, I think, because there are we need each other. A, a, a business full of men and a business full of women are, are going to miss out. We need to all be working together and blending off each other and each other's gifts and each other's personalities. But love that's it. my rant. I <laughs> oh, love it. Love it. You're, you're singing my tune there, Helen. Uh, my wife and I are integrally involved in uh, our business, uh, but co-founders in that regard, and and uh, it works so well because of the fact that uh, there's a real yin and yang. Uh, that, right. that there are fundamentally different skills that we have both uh, that are that are to some degree gender based because you know she's much more nurturing. I'm, I'm she's the heart on the head if you if you like. Yep. Uh, so the rational side uh, comes from from my side. I'm I'm the outward face, but she's the she makes everything happen behind the scenes, and it's just a just a perfect partnership in yeah. in, in the regard to that. And and without her being part of the, such an important and integral part of the exercise, there's no way the business will be where it's at, and vice versa. So it's it's you know, I, I agree with you. It's it's uh, celebrating our differences actually, and then right. uh, looking at okay, what is the overall whole need and then then bring on that that balanced complement to enable that to happen so uh, very refreshing to hear your commentary on that Helen it's um <laughs> it's a, I, I find it's a, a quite a um what's the word it's a a, a polarized debate around that whole exercise I'd find people are either red hot at one end or or at the other and and the there seems to be a, a missing gap in the middle and uh, if there's more people that uh, think like you and I do on that subject, I think the world will be a happier place. Helen, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, 100% agree. And I also think, you know, it's from those kind of thoughts and values that people have that then we have other consequences. So if we look at things like domestic violence, would that exist if we really respected women and um you know, looked after women better? Would we have some of these issues of women being homeless and living out of cars to escape some of the situations that they're in? If we had some of these thought processes like you and I have and lots of other people have and we made that our stance, which I think is a true Australian value, is about respecting each other no matter where you came from or what you have, is about treating each other with respect and kindness and off that lots of other things will then blossom from it, in my opinion. Yeah, 100% agree. I want to, okay, I want to pivot now into uh, the, the world of money for a moment. And <laughs> again, I'd sort of like to, to stick to uh, your money story, if we can start there, and talk to us about your relationship with money and, and ha- how has money been a part of your life. And uh, as, as a financial planner, I'd, I'd love you to share with us uh, where you've invested your own money for what end and talk to us about what your first investment was and uh, how, how that went. Mm. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. I think probably setting the scene of where it all began for me with money. So we we were born in, in the UK. My dad was, um, he was not a well man. He was never expected to live really past 21. Wow. And he did manage to keep on going. He's, he's, an, in, he's an incredible person. Oh, and choke up. Um, yeah, he's an amazing man. And he met my mum, who is an amazing full-on heart woman as well. And I, I really think they were amazing people because back then there was no internet or anything and they had said to my mum and dad, if you move to Australia, you might get a few more years um, than where he would be with the getting into the warmer climate. And mum had uh, three little kids then, me being the third one, and they had a nice home. My dad was working two jobs to maintain that home, um, but, yeah, not wealthy. We just, you know, we come from the, the working class and we moved to the other side of the world. And when you move to the other side of the world back then, it was one way, you know, there was no flying back. The cost of a flight now was the equivalent of, you know, a couple of thousand dollars was a couple of thousand dollars back then, which was yeah. almost a house, you know. So yeah. it was crazy time. And, um, yeah, so we moved to Australia and the idea back then was you got to live in these houses, which were sort of housing commission houses for 
two years you were allowed to rent and then you could buy. So the concept being that we would do that and then mum and dad had the deposit from the sale of the house back home and were to buy a property here. But on the way, uh, my dad got done on a couple of business deals. Some people um, did the wrong thing and they lost the lot. And so I remember growing up then in the rent cycle, in the housing commission cycle of, um, yeah, very financially insecure. My dad worked as much as he could, um, but, you know, we didn't have money sometimes. He was a bricklayer, so sometimes builders chose to pay themselves instead of him. Yeah. And I can still remember one time going to a man's house um, for my dad to pick up a cheque and it was mum and dad and the three of us in the back seat, no seatbelts in those days. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this my dad knocking on the door for his cheque and the man shaking his head in this beautiful flashy home and it's like how are we going to be fed this week, you know. So we had secondhand clothes um, and I remember even that we used to go, I had this yellow skivvy and these grey white pants and they had a big oil mark on the side of my leg on the the pants but I loved these pants and went to primary school and got teased for having secondhand clothes and I remember lying saying oh no I caught it in my bike and thinking oh I just lied that's you know it was like wow I've actually told a big fat lie mm. and remember feeling, you know, the shame, I guess, and the embarrassment of that, but also like proud of my parents too because they were doing the best they could at that time. Yeah. And where we might not have money, we had an overwhelming abundance of love um, in our family. So I grew up very aware that you can be on the street, you can, you know, things can go really south very quickly um, and you have to kind of make your own destination and, and get yourself on your own two feet and stay there, you know. And I think we don't realise these things until we get further down. But as you, I look back when people have asked questions and I think, oh, that's where that came from and that's why I think like that. It's It really um, goes way back and all the way along the journey as well. Mm, so I, I guess what I'm hearing there is that uh – you, there was a value to money. You under, you understood the value of money and how important it was to most aspects of your life at a very early age. Then, Helen, would I be right in saying that? Yeah, for sure. I remember my dad had this tin, and it was like um, a big. I think pencils came in them originally, and my dad had carved out um, little. Um, cuts in it so you could put your money in. So obviously like Barefoot Investor talks about the, those today In I talk about them as pots, you know, having your little pots these days which we're talking about bigger money. But back then it was just pocket money or, um, you know, the lemonade stand or whatever and you put your money in there and you put some away for this. And so, again, another one of the fabric of your being is, way, way, way back as a youngster, just understanding that you needed to put something away and always have a backup plan, always have something there in case you couldn't work or you were sick and or something broke like the old fridge or the, you know, the cars. I remember we always pushed cars down the street. The other neighbours did too. It was a fun thing in hindsight. But, you know, nowadays would you see somebody push starting a car? Pretty unlikely. I don't even know if you can push start a car. They're all so electric and whatever these days, push a button. But, yeah, you, you learn to make sure you've got a backup plan, I think. And, and, and the other thing for me was always I would never have my own business. I would never do what my dad did. I would always be and I would go and – study and I would be an employee and I would always then have a regular salary which I could then manage because it would be the same amount every month and then I could put money away accordingly out of that. So a lot of that was in the fabric very early. Mm, so <laughs> quite a jump for you then to with that with that sort of background to, to leap into your own business as a financial advisor then uh, I would have thought. It would have been must, <laughs> jumping off that cliff must, must have been very challenging for you, Helen. Yeah, and you know what? It's still challenging today. I, I, you have. I always say, 
for me, it's like a roller coaster and I have to learn to embrace the highs and the lows because it seems like every time something goes really good, something really bad seems to happen as well. And so, you know, it's not easy that I think people can look at you and, and just think everything's rosy, everything's easy. And the people who are close to you know how hard everything is, decisions that you have to make, those kind of things where you know, you choose to pay your staff rather than yourself, you know, all of those things, it's not always easy. So, yeah. Mm, yeah, totally agree. Is, is your good father still with us? No, my dad died when um, my mum was 51. And so, again, that opened up another generation of understanding in terms of, um, you know, how does my mum survive? She'd been a stay-at-home mum and hadn't worked since she was maybe 20-ish um, and they told her she, I took it, I remember taking her, it was the CES then, the Centrelink called CES and I took my mum there and said, my mum's become a widow, like what do we do? And they said, she's too young for a widow's pension and I just couldn't get my head around that. I thought, you're a widow or you're not a widow, you know, but it was actually the best thing that happened to her because um, it made her have to go out and get work and she ended up getting a job packing first aid boxes at this at this organisation and it helped get her mind off it, like for eight hours or so a day, you know, um, mum was focused on doing what she was doing and then, you know, obviously then she went home and, cried every night and still misses my dad to this day. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel for you. It's a, a very difficult situation to get, navigate as a family and, and probably with these health issues it was a sort of a question mark hanging over his head and, and all of your heads for, for many years, I'd imagine. Yeah, and I think for myself it was like we knew dad was sick. I don't think we ever knew my dad, how sick my dad was. Mm. He just... He just soldiered on. He was he was that kind of a person. My dad was very proud as far as that went. So I don't think we ever knew. So even when my dad was in hospital, I just remember saying to the doctor, but he'll be fine, won't he? And his face just looked at me as in like, are you, <laughs> in hindsight, you'd say, are you crazy? Like, but yeah, I just never thought it would ever happen. You know, he just, he got through everything. He'd just keep going and... Yeah, but eventually it runs out. Wow. Okay, it's uh, oh, that, that certainly uh, sets a, a scene for us in, in understanding then the, the pathways that you've taken. That sort of it all makes complete sense to me, uh, given all of that. Um, uh, I'd love for you to talk about what was your first investment then? What did you invest in? How did it go? What did you learn from it? <laughs> yeah, I think, I don't know that you'd call them an investment these days. I think you'd call them a scam. But um, <laughs> I remember this so-called opportunity that came across. It was a, a friend who had said to me, oh, you know, come to this event. It was in this little hall and essentially it was pyramid selling. So it was, um, you know, you put in $750, which was in the 80s. So it's a Oh, that was a lot of money back then. Yeah. And then you had to go and find four other people who would put that in and then you got your money out and you made all of that profit and then they had to go and find some more. And so obviously, you know, the people at the top win and anyone down the chain loses pretty quickly. Yeah. And so I lost that money. So, again, it was a big learning for me about the whole get-rich-quick scheme and, um you know, it doesn't work in my opinion. You can get lucky sometimes with different investments or different paths that you take. That's fine. Um, but a lot of people treat investing as almost like a form of gambling in my opinion. You know, it's like, oh, I put this down and and then I'll make all this and I'll be set for life like I win the lottery. And I, my experience is very much, you know, slow and steady wins the race and doing measured smart things at the right time with the right strategies, um, you know, don't try and go chasing those because the pain of losing, well, for me, again, the pain of losing money is, um, yeah, it's 
how do you recover if you keep doing things like that? And we see that sometimes over the years of the decade of, of seeing clients and you hear their stories, how they got caught up in something. And when it sounds too good to be true, it's probably because it is, <laughs> you know. Yeah, 100% agree. And you're singing uh, the right tune here, Helen. We're uh, very much into uh, embracing the fact that success in any endeavour uh, is a long-term journey and it's, yeah. it's about the uh, you know keeping focused on the the end of the game but taking incremental steps over a long long period and and having faith in that rather than chasing the next shiny thing that comes along and you know crypto is the latest one uh, that people <laughs> are betting the house on uh, and and I agree with you that it's a massive gamble and you might get lucky but is it sustainable probably not so, nice. uh, no, very interesting. So, you, let, let's talk about uh, getting you to paint us a picture of your I- ideal lifestyle. When Helen, what what are you doing with who, where, and when? Uh, ha- ha- what, what's what's your vision in that regard? Yeah, I think for me, I'm um, I'm I'm a always out living type of person. So I love being out mixing with friends. You know, love going trying new things. I, I love traveling. Um, I just like experiences. So I'm probably different to a lot of people in that I'm not going to pay $1,000 for a handbag. I am probably not even going to pay $200 for a handbag. In fact, I probably, I can tell you, I've never bought a $200 handbag. (laughs) Um, Those kind of things, I'm just not wired for them. And I would prefer, I love spending time with people. I love talking to people. I love hearing all about what's happening in their world. Um, they're the things that really make my heart sing. I, you'll usually find me on the beach on my board or in my kayak or at the football or on a dance floor. They're the kind of places that I like to be. And a lot of those things don't cost a lot of money. Um, but, yeah, it's it's really about the doing. I don't think I value stuff and I don't have a passion for a massive house or to drive a flashy car. I'm just not wired that way. So it's about propping up the things which take care of the bills, help me feel secure, help me to help out and bless other people because that makes my heart sing too. And um, there's always somebody worse off than you as opposed to focusing on those who are always better off than you. Yeah, I love that. So uh, you probably got a feel for what that that lifestyle cost to you, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of going down the financial planning path with you now. Uh, you've got a, a sense of what what that lifestyle cost to you and the and your family. Uh, what are you and will you uh, invest in to uh, secure that lifestyle long term? Mm. So for me, I big big believer in diversification. So I have properties, I have managed funds. I have some leftover shares from disastrous advice that I copped along the way and I have massive <laughs> losses attached to those that were just, you know, really bad experience for me. Yeah. Um, so I have lots of everything. I don't have crypto. I, I can, I'm can. i open to say I don't have it because, again, I've watched certain things about it and I just, yeah, like you say, some people will do well out of it. I don't want to take the risk with my money because at this stage of my life, I don't want to lose it. I just want to do smart things, be very diversified, things that move at different times. But I also focus on strategy. So one of the things that I think I've tried to help convey in the book is there are things that you can do. And, you know, you might look at investments. There are people everywhere telling you, invest in us, do this, you know, we did better than that. We're the biggest you know, and the best performer. But, you know, you can go somewhere and maybe get an extra half a percent or one percent. Is it really going to change your world? Probably not. Why don't you look strategically at the things that you can do? So classic example is tax. You know, if you can reduce that tax, instead of paying that tax, the tax office and you're paying yourself in a legitimate, honest way, we're not doing anything dodgy, but having things in the right purpose. So I've talked previously to many people and clients about 
Most people think in silos. So they think of their mortgage, they think of their super, they think of all of those things individually. And to me, it's about thinking of a big jigsaw puzzle. And if I put that piece in there and that piece on there, do I speed up getting this puzzle finished? Or if all I do is focus around this little corner over here, I'm missing all these pieces over here, which what I call stretch your money further. So I think the key for me is to, I, I'm too young to access my super, but I also know the benefit of putting money in super, but I need money outside of super in case I want it. I've got my business, I have property, I have my home, I have all of these things now um, by the grace of God that, you know, are there. And so I think it's about not putting your eggs in one basket, but absolutely getting cracking and doing something as early as possible because you get the benefit of time across that. Absolutely. Uh, you're absolutely singing my tune there again, Helen. Uh, <laughs> love your thoughts around all of that. So what would your definition of sustainable success, and I'm going to emphasise and underline the word sustainable in that, that sentence, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so to me it's about having um, an income that allows you, so I talk about what's called a spending and an investment plan. So I don't use the word budget because to me it's like handcuffs and a, and a diet and you get really strict and then you absolutely blow it and you undo all the hard work that you were trying to do. So what I say to clients and for myself is let's work out what you want to spend, which includes putting petrol in the car, maybe put your kids through private school if that's important to you. Um, it's got to have travel, groceries, buying clothes, getting your hair done, your nails done, all the things that are realistic and then have extra left over. So you must have extra left over because that's the piece where you put away for your future. We know that super on its own is never going to be enough. So we need to be putting investments away and putting this extra money away on a regular basis. So that to me is about making sure you've got enough to keep on going. As the phrase says, you know, spend less than you earn. So you've always got something going away. And then that allows you then in the future for those things that you've invested in to produce the income so you don't have to work. So I'm loving hearing all these people who say to me, I don't want to work till I'm 65, Helen. You know, my 20s was for fun. My 30s was for my career. Now that I'm here, I want to be able to get as much done now because I don't want to work until I'm 70 or I'm happy to work for longer but only two days a week. I want to be there for my kids. And I've made decisions like that for myself. I, I couldn't believe I did it once. I thought, you know, you never have time but I made a decision to have Wednesdays off with my mum and we just go out for the day and we have always, she was, oh, I had such a beautiful day. And I said, me too. Like we love that and having flexibility. And I think COVID has helped with that to show you people can work from home and save some time on commuting. There are things that we can put in place. We just need to make sure that the numbers stack up and we've got enough for the now and the future as well. Love it. Love it. And it, it's, you know, a, a, our greatest asset is time, and that and and time spent with with loved ones is is something that uh, can often often be missed in the cut and thrust of uh, the the world that we live in. And and you're right, we've had a big wake up call with COVID and a reminder of just how important uh, friends and family are. But there mm. aren't, aren't many that have the discipline or or are in a position financially because of the commitments they put themselves under to make a decision like I'm going to take Wednesdays off and, and spend it with mum, uh, and it, which is a, a great segue really into uh, your book series uh, on your own two feet, which mm. I you know had the generous opportunity to uh, speed read. Uh, in the the lead up to our discussion today, so would love love for you to talk about the books, uh, if you don't mind. And it's a you know I, I, I love the title on your own two feet. It sort of applies to pretty much every stage of life. Uh, can you talk us through why you wrote the book, what the key messages are, and then we'll sort of unpack some of that because there's some really great principles that you've uh, and timeless principles really that you've outlined in the book. Yeah, thanks. The, the reason that I wrote the book was I just felt at one point in time, you know, whether how, depending on how you view it, for me, like, you know, God said, if I 
write this book. So, for example, classic cases, you know, you go to a function and everybody's having a drink and a good time, great. And then you think, you know what, if everybody put in $20 today, we could buy somebody out of sex trafficking was the start of my thing or human trafficking because you realise a lot of that comes from money and poverty and um, lies and deception and so you can change somebody's life, which is amazing. Yeah. And But then I thought, you know what, those people are probably supporting cancer research. They're probably supporting the Salvation Army. They've already got their own homes and home families with whatever's going on in their lives. Some people have disabled kids and, you know, there are things that people are committed to. So I thought, you know what, I get paid for my advice by serving my clients. So what if I write a book that gets the message out much broader because I can't meet with everybody But here's an opportunity to spread this wide and get the message out to people and men and women. So we're not an anti-men book by any stretch. (laughs) But it's like, you know, get the message out there for for the mums, for the nanas, because lots of people were saying to me, I wish I met you 10 years ago. And I think, well, I wish you did too because you'd be in a better position if you knew this. Or they say, if I'd have read this article that you wrote. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to write it. We can help people in the first world by getting the message out and then with the money we can go and do something that saves lives in the third world. And so that was the purpose of actually writing the book. It wasn't about me getting a Porsche or anything. Not that I'd buy a Porsche anyway, but sorry, unless you want to give me a Porsche, whoever Mr Porsche is out there. Uh, I totally agree. Well, I, I think uh, if anyone was thinking they are going to make a million dollars out of a book, they'd be sadly kidding themselves uh, Helen, yeah. uh, big, big time. There, are, uh, there's more books being produced uh, in this day and age than than ever, with the move to self publishing and, and all the rest of it. But I, I'm I'm with you. The reason I wrote my books was just to be able to uh, get the message out to as many people as I possibly could, because our own personal finite resources are pretty limited in our ability to do that. So, fully commend you on on that score. And I, I don't know if it's work this way for you but I, I know in in the uh, the blood sweat and tears of writing the book I actually got way better at communicating the the core cool messages that I'd, I'd been talking about for 20 years but uh, when you have to sit down with pen in hand and and a keyboard under your fingers uh, suddenly you've got to be able to put it in a framework uh, that is easy for other people to understand uh, did you have that experience and then then rolling on from there would love for you to unpack some of the key messages as you see it Yeah, so I think I chose to read nothing that was out there. And I first launched this book's in its third right, third third edition now. So it was back in the 2013 14, which is similar when Barefoot Investor came out as well. Um, But because I'd self published, I I had a different route. But I hadn't, so I didn't know of his book at the point in time. Yeah. And. I didn't look at what anyone else had written either because I know finance is so boring to people. It's so it's dull, you know, and um, I thought I just want to write it the way that I think people can read it and engage. And very fortunately, people say all the time, I can actually hear you as I'm reading it, Helen. It just sounds like I'm you're sitting here talking to me. And so I didn't want it dry, but I thought having been through what I went through even as from childhood, but also when I started the business. And when you go from having a salary, a six-figure salary for a very long time down to nothing and you have to go and find clients and you have to start doing all of this stuff, again, it's another wake-up call about how you need to have a cushion behind you and how you manage money. And I believe that's where I, I got my head around the five, what I call the five foundations because it was like, what can I work with right now? Because I couldn't invest because I didn't have money and it was actually the GFC. So I'd actually thought I'd just lost my house because I'd been thrown into this margin loan with super aggressive stocks that were a complete disaster because, again, the way that you would approach investing if you're earning lots of money um, and you've got money to spare is one thing to go the other side now you've opened a business and you need 
you have no salary and you've got to try and make this work and you've got to study again and it's like it takes a long time before you get on your feet with your business as well. So they're two very different ways of living. So I was at the point where, you know, being a you go to the beach every weekend, but I would not even go to the beach because I couldn't have didn't want to sell the investments I had to pay for the petrol because the investments were so crushed from the GFC. And so I worked in those on those five foundations and maximised every opportunity that I had in there. And then when the time was right, then I started building on top. And so that's why I say to people now, you know, get those foundations right. No one has ever passed my five foundations test. So it's quite difficult to do. And but they're all things that we can work on and that protects what you build on top because what you don't want is to lose your job or get unwell and not have those things in place and all the top comes crashing down. So we can go and buy properties right, left and centre if we want or shares or investments, but if you get this wrong underneath and someone's depending on you and things go wrong, if you don't have the backup plan, you're going to have to start selling things. And Murphy's Law says as soon as you've got to sell it's worth nothing. It's, you know, people can sell it and you get nothing for what, you, what you've what you got. So, 100% yeah. agree. Well, let, let's break down those five foundations because, uh, again, uh, using your jigsaw analogy, which is it's interesting you use that one because I use exactly the same one, by the way. It's, oh, good. Uh, yeah, because it, it just makes sense. It's putting the whole picture together and, and rather than the silo approach, uh, which never gets any attention really, uh, or any orchestrated strategy that pulls all those together. Uh, I think your five financial fundamentals are a great, great way to build that on. Can you sort of break it down a little bit for us so that uh, we've got a much better appreciation of what the key aspects of that are? Yeah, for sure. So the first one's just the simple emergency fund, you know, having that money available should you lose your job or or a good opportunity comes along. You know, lots of kids are making this star team and they're going to Europe or the Olympics and you need to go or you want to help out your kids with something for their car or whatever it is. So having that big pot there to keep you going. Now, I used to say three months of bills and expenses was sort of reasonable and fun money. But I think we've learned with COVID that it needs to be longer because depending on what industry you're in, you can be wiped out pretty quickly um, or your partner can if you're depending on them. And again, you know, you're a two-income family or a one-income family supporting the lot. So the emergency fund for everybody will be different. I have some who need 250000 sitting in their emergency fund and then we have other people who have two grand and, they're, you know, everybody's different depending on where you're at. So the second one's what I call that spending and investment plan, so what we were talking about before. So you can work out what your spending is, you know, spreadsheets or all the things, apps, whatever's out there, grab those, work out what your spend is for all your bills, your fund money, and then what's left over. And then the question on the investment part is what do you do with it? Do you put it on the mortgage? Do you put it on your, in your super? Do you start another investment? What do you do with that money to stretch it as far as he can and make it work for you. Number three is one of the most complicated of all, and that's in the insurances. So you've got private health insurance and you've got general insurance, which is the home contents, the cars, all those kind of things. The one where a lot of people get caught, and we talk in the book about all the different life events, and that's the key part of my book is that life events. But if you don't have this right, this is where it goes wrong. So you've got life insurance, total and permanent disablement, income protection and trauma, and they all have a different purpose. I won't get into all the details of them because I will put you to sleep, right? That does get technical. <laughs> but the, a lot of people have them in super and it's always never enough or it's not covered in the right places or it's too much of one and not enough of the other, like it's always a problem in there. Yeah. And the biggest problem at the moment in the last 16 months is the insurance world has changed enormously. So there are big issues where people will think they're insured only to go and find they're no longer insured. It's been wiped out because they happen to not open a letter or they didn't make a contribution when they should have, or they didn't have the right balance, or they didn't opt in. This is a massive, massive, massive issue. And we see lots of people, even just last week, 
um, you know, bless him, 47 years old, passed away, leaving wife and kids. And then, you know, these things happen. We all think it happens when you're 65 or 80. It happens all along the way. Bad cards get dealt to good people. So you've got to make sure that you've got that set. And one of the big things which ties in with number four is around superannuation. So you will hear all the time about consolidate your super, consolidate your super. Please do not consolidate your super without getting advice because this is where insurances live. And for some people, obviously having them outside is good too. It's probably stronger and a better outcome. But super holds some insurances and unless you've got the right amount you don't want to be shutting them down or you find out when you go and see your advisor when you tell them something that you should have made a claim because you didn't realize you could have claimed on something and you need to go back and make that claim so those things are important mental health is a massive one um, in there so in super you know it's like the consolidation please get advice fees don't believe everything you hear about fees because there are, well, that's a whole thing in itself, but don't believe everything you hear. Get advice around the fee part. Yeah. Um, how you're invested. So that will change through whether you're 20, whether you're 40, whether you're 60. You know, investments will be how much risk you want to take and what's appropriate for you and wh- where should you be investing. How should you invest is a whole other complex part. Yep. The insurance inside we talked about and then nominations. So, you know, uh, I don't have children of my own and, you know, so most of us single women will be leaving our um, super to our mum and unless you're my mum where we can prove financial dependency, um, you know, there is no, you can't give it to your mum directly through super. They can only be certain people who can receive your super. So the nominations where people think, oh, I want to leave it there for my kids because they've split up in a divorce or something, so I'm leaving it to my mum. Like none of those things don't work unless they're right. Yeah. And then that ties in with number five, which is estate planning. So, you know, the wills, the powers of attorney, but most importantly, Almost all of the clients that we work with, we we talk to them about what's called a testamentary discretionary trust. And again, this is about stretching your legacy and your inheritance that either you receive or you're giving by maximising the opportunities around tax and most importantly, keeping it in the bloodline should a relationship break down in the future. So all of those pieces, you know, we can go talk about all of those for hours and hours, but we won't (laughs) because... You will fall asleep if you're driving. So, yeah, <laughs> please go and get advice about that because, honestly, in my industry, we are. I'm still learning. All of us still talk about different things. There, are, The devil is absolutely in the detail when it comes to this stuff and avoiding a mistake is my big passion. Like, we don't know what we don't know. So go and get an expert to tell you the truth about what's right and what's wrong and what's right for you. Beautifully said, absolutely beautifully said, and, and you're you know, spot on with your uh, direction there in relation to just not knowing what we don't know. That there, mm. there is so much in behind it, and you can be stepping on a landmine without even knowing you're doing it. And the the only way you can overcome that is surround yourself with good, independent, professional advice, uh, like the advice that you offer. Let, let's let's slightly shift now into the uh, world of women if we can, because it's it's a subject mm. that we haven't really uh, dug into in any great detail on Get Invested. And, uh, you know, your your books, uh, but particularly I'd, I'd love to, to circle around the divorce topic if we can, because it's mm. uh, unfortunately it's a, a growth industry. Uh, there's yes. way too many going that way and very little thought put into before, during and after uh, the impact on the financial situation and unfortunately it's pretty devastating to all parties that are affected by that both financially and emotionally obviously Mm. Uh, can you sort of talk us through uh some of the key issues that that women face that is that is unique unique to women and that sort of background to that and then weave into that discussion uh what that means in the divorce scenario and how how women can best protect themselves uh, in the lead up to during and, and after that unfortunate event yeah, it's a, it's a really complex area, the divorce area, and I think it's a classic case of we 
we don't know what we don't know and it's an area where you can make a boo-boo and usually when it comes to anything financial, the boo-boos are big. They're way more expensive than getting quality advice to prevent a mistake. And what I was seeing was the amount of women who were coming in, and it's not only divorce because obviously de facto a lot of people don't marry these days, they live together and, you, you know, the stats on that will be enormous as well. But people were coming in in what I call post-settlement phase. So it's done and dusted, they signed off and this is what they walk away with. And it was um, then that I was saying, oh, no, <laughs> like, why did you take that asset or what happened here? Oh, you know, and so that's when I started talking about pre-settlement advice and trying to get the message out about pre-settlement before you sign on the dotted line. Go and speak to a specialist financial advisor who understands the, what what's right for you and how to avoid a mistake. So I, that was why I wrote the divorce book, but some of it is in this book as well. Yeah. And I talk about those stages because we all know we need to go and get the lawyer and everybody wants to lawyer up and, yeah, I'm going to, you know, protect myself or I'm going to come out fighting. But really good lawyers know that they cannot give you financial advice. Yeah. And so they try and get the client to go and get advice. But from an, a client's perspective, they think, I don't see why I need to go. You know, again, it's back to that thing of, are they just going to sell me an investment or they don't understand these pieces of the foundations or how what they build in top works for them. Will they have enough for a future? And for a lot of things, you know, there are some nice divorces, if there could be such a word, where, wow. you know, when the other side can get explained about this is the outcome for, in, in, in mine it's generally the women, so this is the outcome for her or the, your kids down the track. But if you move that there to that, then this she's going to be okay and you will earn more because of that whole issue of gender pay gap and whatever, you'll be fine. So when you can get people who are reasonable, it's it's really good to be able to work those things out. When it's nasty, obviously it's more difficult and probably more imperative that you really do get some support or know what you don't know before you commit. And, again, that was a reason with the book is like, well, you can read it and go, oh, that's why they kept saying get financial advice. Now I understand it's complicated, but I go, okay, I can DIY from here or mine's really complicated. I need to go and get some help to make sure, you know, I do that. And, you know, that sort of stuff really makes my heart sing because w once you've signed, you're, that's it. It's over. You can't go back and and revisit it. So it's really about getting on the front foot. And, um, and I would argue to a certain point, it really reduces legal costs for a lot of people because they actually know what they want and why. And it helps them to negotiate better because they can see why something is good or bad for them rather than back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, and then walking away and going, oh, this is what I've got, you know. Totally. And it's usually not right. <laughs> no, it's spot on. What are some of the biggest mistakes you see uh, that, that occur in the, in the lead up to that unfortunate event? Yeah, I think a lot of times – women are not engaged throughout the course of the event. So they actually don't know where everything is and they don't know how things are being invested and they don't understand how what it means for them um, or know enough to feel confident. So they're generally signing off on things that are, don't fit. Some of the big ones are usually around the house because we as women are wired for security and we want to put our pictures on the wall. We want to make sure our kids come home to their own bedrooms and to try and keep stability. And women will sacrifice themselves for their kids generally. So they need to understand that actually in the best interest of your kids is making sure that you're financially sound and that you make good decisions and that everything works for all of you. Um, the other thing that they often do is make sacrifices to their own detriment and try and be like a two-income family when they are now only on one income. And it's actually to the – it's not good for the kids. I mean, it's hard and no one wants to go through it, but if you can demonstrate to your children that actually 
things have to change because now we're on one income here and I have to say no to some things. You're actually protecting your kids for the future because you're teaching them about money. So these kids then are less likely to get caught up in massive credit card debt or a massive mortgage that they can't afford because they've had some understanding about, yeah, money does not grow on trees, the old adage that we all learned. Um, you know, so it's an opportunity to teach them and protect them at the same time. Yeah, beautifully, beautifully said. Well, what about the other situation that I unfortunately see a lot, and that is, you know, the uh, uh, male partner uh, passes, and uh, quite often, if it's you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking personally here, my my good mother, God bless her, uh, when my father passed away, uh, dad. Dad made the money and and handled the money and Mum looked after the home and and it was a, a massive shock and uh, a very stressful situation for her because she didn't know anything about where the money was. Uh, she'd never managed money, so uh, you know apart from a jam jars that she had to uh, live off the budget that Dad had set for for many years. It's a very confronting situation for many widowers. Uh, that end up in that scenario. What What are your mm. thoughts around uh, again the best way uh, to protect themselves in the lead up to and then then after that situation? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, bless. So, yeah, I feel your pain because obviously you know that's kind of my mum's situation as well, and lots of other and and young people that you see these things tragically happen to with little kids that have still got to be raised as well. You know. Um, my experience with it is that a lot of times women have defaulted where the man has taken care of it and my experience is that often he has either gone down something really risky or actually done nothing and parked all the money in a term deposit. So people have often sat in two camps but I've been very blessed over the years where husbands have come in with their wives saying, look, I just want to make sure she's okay and that my wife is connected to somebody if something happens so that I know she, you know, is going to be taken care of. And so I've had quite a lot of that. And so those guys are great and um, we, we really like those kind of people. But it's about being engaged. And I remember one client who um, they came in, it was that kind of a situation. And we go through a bit of a process, you know, the first meetings just to get to know you. And then we go through these other ones, which dig into a lot more about your values. And we'll call her Jane for one of a better word. And, and Jane um, was saying, was totally engaged all the way through. And then we do, before we commit to actually doing a plan, we do what's called an investment philosophy meeting. So explaining about investments and how they're working and I remember seeing Jane just sit back in her chair and fold her arms as in like oh I'm not going to understand this and I drew it on the whiteboard back to the old teacher <laughs> plan day and you know not not too heavy just you know a little bit Goldilocks of just right to to get them to understand enough to make a decision and Jane said to me at the end because Jane had sat forward and listened and and said at the end, you know what, I actually understand that. So I couldn't go out and explain it to everybody else. And I said, that's okay because there's a reason, as my mum says, it's like, if it's so easy, why do you have to study all the time and do all these things? It's because it's not easy. Um, but the idea is that you feel safe and that's something really important to me, that women and men feel safe, have an understanding, are making decisions that they're comfortable with. Sure, have experts implement them. Have experts keep explaining to you in a language that you understand, but you must feel safe. And the thing I love about, I guess men have it too, but certainly the women, I always say to women, you can feel it. We get that thing inside when something is going, this is not right, I feel wobbly, or then run, you know, go. But if you get to the thing where you feel safe and you can see how it all pieces together enough, then away you go. Yeah, it's great advice and that. That that inbuilt intuition is is something that uh, again a lot of people ignore in this day and age to their their detriment. But uh, mm. uh, if if the gut is is telling you, then it's generally telling you for a very good reason. 
So uh, yeah. totally agree. All right, I'd, I'd like to switch now into what I refer to as the the ambush round, uh, which is just <laughs> the the fast five questions that uh, l- listeners, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, love to uh, glean your words of wisdom on, Helen. Uh, first of those, what's what's your favourite quote and why? Probably my favourite quote is, you can't buy peace, they don't sell it in the shop. So it's about doing things that make you happy, make you comfortable, make you peaceful, make you glad. Um, and when we know when that's not the case, then, yep, run. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I haven't heard that one, actually. Uh, love it. Uh, what about in the, in the literary field, apart from reading your book, obviously, uh, what would be the uh, top book that you'd uh, recommend listeners have a read of and why? Yeah, that's a difficult one for me because I can't think of one that I would say other than mine. Um, (laughs) But I would probably say read something that doesn't have an agenda. You know, there are a lot of things where people write for the purpose of then engaging you in something that they can sell you. And whatever industry that is, doesn't have to be finance industry. There are a lot of things out there. And I think you've got to be wise to go, okay, why are they telling me this? What is the agenda behind what they're doing? Because again, you're there to, you get your life, your control, your decisions. And conversely, I read a lot of non financy things. I read biographies and autobiographies because I love knowing about people. And I think we learn a lot more from those um, than we do a lot of other ang- aspects that are out there. Agreed. Have you got a favourite? What's a book that you've gifted to someone then? Yeah, mine. <laughs> mine, actually, I just, I actually don't gift books I, other than mine to, to people that I meet. I I just don't. I I don't, I just love reading about sports people again because they're generally never, no one's really ever had it easy, I don't think. You know, everyone's had something in their life, but it makes them who they are. So, yeah, nothing, sorry, that comes to mind. No, that's good. To help there. No, that's all right. That's all right. No, all good. Um, uh, moving into the uh, taxation area because uh, Australians generally still feel they pay too much tax, although if you paying a lot of tax and you're making money, which is a good thing. But uh, what, what's the top legal thing that you've done to minimise the tax that you pay, Helen? Yeah, I agree with you. I would say that, you know, if you've got to, if you've got to pay tax, it's a good thing. It means that you've um, achieved something or you've earned something. But I think, again, it's about not being in silos. So think bigger Um, get advice about how it all pieces together, you know, how you shave some tax off this in order to put it over here and build your wealth. So, you know, classic at the moment is first home buyers where I've just recently had an issue with a client who let me know about their son buying a property, but by the time we got to help them understand the strategy, it was too late. They'd already gone to contract and you can't then implement that strategy. But it's like, well, you can pay the tax office or you can pay yourself. They're the options. We know what we prefer to do. So, again, it's getting advice before you commit to those things and then you doing a tax effective, what I would say, a tax effective or stretching your money opportunities that are out there. Yeah, beautifully said. Yeah, I love that. Uh, term that you're st- stretching your money further. It's uh, it's a really good analogy there. Uh, back on the investment front, then, Helen, what's both yep. the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received today? Yeah, I think the worst one is um, you know just that constant putting all your eggs in the one basket. You know, and um, not knowing what you're putting in. Back to that thing of you know the get rich quick schemes. All of those aspects, I think, are the are the worst ones that you can make. In terms of the best ones, I just think actually diversification I think is key, um, but they need to tie in strategically. You can go and invest in something, but if it doesn't fit with when you need money or how it's going to piece together, then you're going to have to break it and undo what you tried to achieve. So I think actually investing in wisdom is, um, you know, I we talk around here in the office a lot and just love hearing people's wisdom and making good decisions with what you've got. That'll stretch your money further as well. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, final one of the, the fast five, what's a personal habit, a, a rewarding ritual or a daily discipline that you 
uh, have embraced that's contributed most to your investment success to date? Just not getting in over your head. I think, you know, again, slow and steady winning the race, doing the right things that make sense at the right time so that you're always growing what you've got. You're always um, building and expanding rather than going backwards, further backwards, forwards, backwards, all over the place. You know, just do things that are measured and and make more sense than over here ad hoc, stopping, starting, undoing, fixing, chasing after the next shiny, you know what I mean? It's like a restlessness. It's like do things that give you peace and that make sense and be prepared to do these things for a long period of time. Not sure I'm doing this very quickly to your uh, thing no, about it. That's good. No, it's good. Uh, <laughs> it's brilliant. That, that, that's uh, And, and that, that restlessness versus the peace, I, I, I love the way you're describing that and, and taking a a long-term approach. Uh, again, we live in a world that, uh, you know, delayed gratification is, is something that's died on the vine many years ago and uh, trying to just um, uh, motivate and inspire people to recognise the benefits of taking the, the long-term approach and that, that slow and steady wins the race exercise I, I find quite challenging. How do you overcome that one in terms of getting that message through? Yeah, I think, again, generally people who've come to see me have already had a bad experience or have heard of a bad experience, so they're reluctant to do it again, which is good. Um, and then when you sing a different song, they can hear it. They know it's different. They know that you're not there to belt them out with some stupid, crazy idea. Um, they can just they just know. And so I think it's about when they see that, they feel safe, they can trust you, you know, they, like they always say, you know, I wish I met you five years ago or 10 years ago or whatever. It's like, well, that's all right. Let's work with where we're at now and just try and make it better for going forward. Yeah, well said. Final question then that uh, sort of gives you an opportunity to sort of summarise the, the your sort of key, key mission and key messages, Helen. If I gave mm. you a microphone that spoke to every single one of the roughly 7.7 billion people that are currently alive in the world and I gave you 60 seconds to talk... What would you suggest people invest in? <laughs> I don't know. Could I do it in 60 seconds? That would be interesting. <laughs> well, I think when you think about 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, you've got the haves and the have-nots. And so my message would be if you are a have, a significant have, and there are plenty out there, in my opinion, you have a responsibility to move that money to people who are less fortunate than you and change lives, not necessarily gifting money, but as in, you know, teach a man to fish, teach a woman to fish, whatever that phrase is, like let's consider other people. And instead of always looking at the haves and trying to always be chasing the Joneses, think about the people who have not. We are better off than a lot of people in the world. And instead of trying to do more and more and get ourselves on a treadmill, why don't we actually take care of ourselves, be kind to ourselves and do the things that we never get back, which is spending time with people and gifting and helping somebody else so you change somebody else's life along the way. Hallelujah to that. Absolutely love that message. Uh, for those that, that have really uh, turned on to, uh, you know, the, the quite heart-based message that uh, it, it is clearly the foundation of everything you do, Helen, uh, how, how do they get in touch with you? And, and as a flow on from that, where, where can they get a copy of your great books? Yeah, so very fortunate now that they should all be in the bookstore or on your line, online favourite bookstore on the line, as they say. Um, but, yeah, we're at onyourowntwofeet.com.au. There's videos there. If you Google anything, there will be a string of articles in the interweb that you can draw from and um, and hopefully it's, it's just something in there that's a little diamond that helps helps you and changes your focus or changes your life. That would make my heart sing. Love it. You've been very generous with your time today as you're obviously generous with everyone that you work with, Helen. So uh, really appreciate you reaching out and coming on the show today uh, and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Really appreciate you having the time. Thanks, Helen. To get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes, just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O -L at khgroup.com.au. Or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast. So thanks for listening. And as always, dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die.